Good afternoon, uh, buongiorno. Um, can I welcome everybody here to Bologna and uh, on this very important event where we're going to discuss human trafficking and modern slavery. And the purpose of today is just to talk about this issue, how it affects our global community, how it affects individuals, but importantly, how faith and faith groups and the Interfaith Forum can influence and change perhaps how the G20 responds or to identify where it is working well. And I'll move to our panel shortly. Um, and I'm also very privileged to have such a good, well-esteemed audience with me and panel. But first of all, where does faith take its role on this issue? Well, if we look across the world, we suddenly realize that there are over 40 million people suffering in human trafficking and modern slavery. Mm -hmm. Whilst it is a crime where people are generating over 150 billion US dollars every year. And we have many responses and thankfully we have people like Sister Gabriella Botani and religious sisters and other people of faith fighting this, challenging this every day on the coal face, on the front line, dealing with anger, hatred, and coming against it with love and compassion. And of course, this isn't happening in a vacuum. We have this where it's connected to other crime, whether that crime be terrorism, whether that crime be other forms of exploitation, whether that be corruption. But as I say, human trafficking doesn't operate in a vacuum. We've seen now that it's 21 years since the Palermo Protocol was agreed to suppress and punish trafficking in persons. This was supported immediately by the United States introducing its own trafficking legislation and the State Department providing resources to oversee progress across the world. Over the past few years, prosecutions of traffickers and the identification of victims, shockingly, have declined. The latter may be due to COVID, but the slowing of the criminal justice interventions marks significant concerns. If I give you an example in the United Kingdom, whilst the numbers of victims identified through the National Referral Mechanism, which is the government-funded project, have risen year on year, until last year when there was a slight decline, there is about 10,000 people every year enter that system to be identified as a formal victim of crime and then getting the support measures that should be provided. However, at the current time, there are 22,000 people waiting for confirmation as to whether they are a victim or not. So many of those are waiting over two years for a decision on whether they are a victim. And in that time, they are lost, lost in a system. These are women and girls who may have been sexually exploited, men who may be in forced labor, people who may have been used for organized crime at the whim of serious criminals. So we need to look at this global phenomenon of human trafficking we know Pope Francis has talked about the globalization of indifference and how that has affected our world. But we need to challenge those what are becoming norms. So it is important for us to understand the role that faith can play in shaping the global response. When I have been, whether it's in Africa, Southeast Asia, southern Italy or in Greece or the United Kingdom or Ireland and I look at the suffering that people endure day in day out whether they've been forced to sell their bodies at the behest of organized criminals whether it's somebody who has been forced to work whether it's somebody who has been forced to commit crimes for organized criminals I see an absence of compassion. I see an absence of responses 
and sometimes the worst absence is that of accountability. So we need change. We need to bring change. We have seen the change that the world has faced in the last 18 months with COVID. We need to escalate this pandemic of exploitation to remove it from our planet. If we return to faith, what is it that we really need to do? Well, we need to have honesty associated to this phenomenon. We need to understand and accept its reality. We need to agree that we will no longer tolerate this, but we need to have compassion when we respond to it. We cannot see victims as just someone who is a vehicle to prosecution or somebody who should be left and should have to beg for every step for their support. We have many protocols, the UN, the EU, the Council of Europe, and many more. And when we see how it's connected to other issues, for example, climate change, people are displaced, corruption as governments operate and sometimes benefit from trafficking, terrorism, where it's been shown in northern Iraq and Libya, terrorists were funding their criminality through trafficking, particularly of girls and women, in markets where they would be sold for sexual exploitation. And gun crime and drugs, where organized criminals used either trafficked people to distribute their goods or sometimes to even manufacture them. So we need to be aware of this and start to build responses that work collaboratively, perhaps as the way we do with terrorism, perhaps as the way we have with COVID. But what we need to do is perhaps bring the learnings from both of those areas to come up with a response that meets the challenge of human trafficking and modern slavery. Returning to faith, and as I said, truth. Well, we need to have the truth. We need to start to recognize that our response is nowhere near commensurate to the threat this crime presents. We need to realize that the identification of less than 1% of victims around the world is not good enough. We need to realize that the fact that 99.9% .9 of the time criminals operate with impunity. And it is faith that actually tells us John said in 8.32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That is so for Christian. In Islam, God rewards the truth no matter what the situation. In Judaism, truth is the seal of the Holy One. In Sikhism, Guru Nanaka, Nanak said, truth is high but higher still is truthful living. In Buddhism, speaking truthfully and honesty to the benefit of others is seen as an important principle. And many religions and most faiths echo this. So it's important for us as people of faith and the Interfaith Forum to reveal the truth to the G20 and then to assist them with how they design models that will counter this that are sufficiently funded, sufficiently resourced, but have the human being at the center of their response and are not built around economic desires or economic well-being. It has to be about the person. So that is what we are here to discuss. And I have got a great audience uh, today from across the world but it is the speakers here who will help us today to explain this. My co-chair, uh, who is with me, will help to guide us and assist us uh, and will help us in what we have to say around the world. So I'm particularly grateful for Daniela Verga, who is a diplomatic advisor to the Grand Chancellor of the Sovereign Order of Malta and has extensive knowledge on international negotiations and international policy. Uh, Gabriela Botani, who is the international coordinator of Talitha Kum, 
as a religious sister, Gabriela has really shaped and changed the way that religious sisters have responded to this. And I've had the pleasure to speak on panels with Gabriela before, but also more, uh, I suppose, humili the humility and the work that she does really is something that drives change. Uh, and Nello Scalva, Scalvo, sorry, is a journalist who has written books, including about Pope Francis in his young days, and very much about the migrant crisis, which obviously is a big issue when it comes to trafficking. So I would like now to uh, hand over to Daniela, who will also join us. And I'm not sure we were hoping to be joined by Sister Denise Coughlin, who is a Sister of Mercy, who is in, uh, um, uh, in the Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm not sure if we've been able to link up with her today, uh, whether that's been possible. Uh, no. So, okay. Um, so, um, I will hand over to you now, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you for your remark. I will uh, add uh, some... I will add only some uh, few remarks, starting by reminding what Pope Francis called as um, human trafficking, a crime against humanity, a scourge that wounds the dignity of our weakest brothers and sisters. Human trafficking and modern slavery are, uh, as has been uh, said by Kevin, global and wise spread crimes based on profit, the culture of profit that consider human being as a commodity that can be freely exploited. The organized network or individuals, or to be clear, the big national and transnational criminal organizations behind these lucrative crimes take advantage of people who are vulnerable, disparate, escaping natural disaster, conflict, or persecution, or seeking employment, education, family reunification opportunity, or simply seeking a better life. For necessity, people, often minors, are forced to sell their body or part of their body Many victims are tricked or coerced into having their organs removed. Particularly vulnerable are unaccompanied or abandoned minors. To be reminded that slavery generates the second largest profits of international crime after drug trafficking. Everyone, everywhere, has the right to a life free from slavery. But right now, millions of children and adults are trapped into slavery in every single country in the world, including ours. The United Nations Office on Drug and Crime found that children are being increasingly targeted by traffickers who are using social media and other online platforms to recruit new victims and profiting from increased demand for child sexual exploitation materials. In recent years, the internet and the social networking sites have become tools that traffickers use to find vulnerable people who they can then exploit. Websites are like an iceberg. Only a small part emerges, and most of it is submerged. From top to bottom, deep web and dark web, including child pornography and child sexual abuse material. A study issued by the above mentioned UNODC last July illustrates the devastating impact of COVID-19 on victims and survivors of human trafficking 
and highlights the increased targeting and exploitation of minors. The pandemic has increased vul vulnerability to trafficking in persons while making trafficking even more harder to detect and leaving victims struggling to obtain help and access to justice, said UNODC Executive Director Gada Wali. In the 21st century, almost every country has legally abolished chattel, slavery by descent. But the number of people currently enslaved around the world is far greater than the number of slaves during the historical Western slave trade. In the old form of slavery, slave owners spent more time on getting slaves. In modern slavery, people are easier to get at a lower price, so replacing them when exploiters run into problems become easier. According to a, some estimation by World Free Foundation, American slaves in 189 were sold for around the equivalent of US dollar 40,000 in today money. Today, a slave can be bought for $9,100. Kevin re remembered countries that ratified the Palermo Protocol and the many other international instruments on trafficking in person. So, this uh, the trafficking should be criminalized and uh, governments should develop and apply anti-trafficking laws in line with the, the protocol's legal provisions. The latest UN DOSC global report on trafficking in person highlighted the low rate of conviction for human trafficking globally. UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Form of Slavery stressed that between 62% and 90% of countries in the world have ratified the core international instrument on slavery and forced labor, while only 47% while of countries have no provision criminalizing slavery or the slave trade. There is a, a need of action. The ILO Director General, Guy Ryder, said that there is no inevitability, no excuse. With commitment and the right policies and institutions, forced labor can be stopped. By working together, untangling person after person from slavery and dismantling the systems that enables exploitation, we can deliver true freedom to people across the globe. What the religious communities can do. Religious communities can help on two levels through public or targeted appeals to remind government and the civil society of the need to respect the life and dignity of every human being, including interfaith action. Through concrete measures for the prevention of trafficking, for the identification, protection, and the physical, psychological, and spiritual rehabilitation of the victims. This action can be taken by religious organizations, communities, specialized congre congregation, especially sister, and uh, Gabriella Botani will uh, give us um, a witness of, of, of their action, but also at the level of the individual parish. Let me conclude in my this introductory remarks by mentioning that 
the sovereign order of Malta also contributes to this common effort against human trafficking. As a faith-based institution, since its foundation in the Holy Land 900 years ago, the Order of Malta has pursued two goals, defending the faith and helping the most vulnerable. Among the most vulnerable today are certainly the victims of human trafficking. For this reason, in 2017, the Order of Malta decided to appoint two ambassadors to monitor and combat human trafficking one based in Africa and one in Geneva. Romain de Villeneuve has therefore supported the construction of the Maison Baquita in Lagos, which houses women returning from Europe who have been trafficked. It's a pilot project carried out together with Sister Patricia Egbulen, sister of St. Louis. In uh, in the following uh, remark, I will submit some uh, practical proposal and uh, ideas to be more effective in our uh, in our action. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, ask Sister Gabriella Botani if you could present on the work of Talitha Kum, but also uh, what you think is required of the international community and at grassroots to counter this. Distinguished panelists, Mr. Kevin Highland, thank you for inviting and thank you also for introducing this uh, uh, painful and violent reality. This is the crime of human trafficking. I am honored to be part uh, of Time to Heal, the G G20 Interfaith Forum, which I consider a prophetic call for today, which echoes the cry of victims of human trafficking. They are women, men, and children of all cultures and all faiths. I belong to Talita Kum, the international network of Catholic sisters engaged in combating human trafficking, set up by the International Union of Superior General in 2009. Today, we count 60 active networks involving over 3,000 sisters, allies, and friends who last year supported over 15,000 survivors. My speech today is the result of the work started in September 2019 to promote a Talita Kum call to action. Today, I will offer a preview, and November 25th, we will present the final outcome of this two-year-long process of, uh, from a bottom-up process involving all the networks. Faith and spirituality witness and make tangible the presence of God to transform even the most hopeless situation and raise what seems to be death to life. This is Talita Kum, little girl, I say to you, rise up, from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus pronounced these words to Jairus' daughter, a 12-year-old who laid apparently dead. Jesus took her hand and she immediately stood up and began to walk. She was healed. The expression Talita Kum defines the network's identity and mission by referring to the transformative power of hope, compassion and mercy. In a very unique way, the life histories of millions and millions of trafficked and exploited victims and survivors reach out to us today with their hands, just as Jesus did with the young girl, inviting us to rise up with courage and hope and to stand by our commitment for a just world in which every human being lives alive in dignity and fullness. Talita Kum is a network in dialogue with different faiths. 
only to give some example, Talitakum, Thailand, Catholic sisters are collaborating with Buddhist nuns. In the Middle East, uh, it started our first interreligious network involving uh, Catholic, uh, uh, Orthodox, uh, Muslim, and Druze women. In Italy, we started a dialogue at a ecumenical level with other Christian churches. When we meet victims in various contexts of vulnerabilities, such as women and children exploited in the sex market, undocumented migrants, asylum seekers, people in detention, street children, we try to establish a trustful relationship providing not only urgent assistance, but also responding to their spiritual needs in the respect of the faith of each person. We meet as sisters and brothers, hosting them as our most welcome guests. All over the world, we are observing an increase of cases of human trafficking and situation of vulnerabilities exploited by traffickers faced with a decrease in governmental resources, resources for assisting victims and survivors. The pandemic exacerbated the situation, including the difficulties to provide job, education, housing, and psychosocial health care. These are basic policies for a real healing process and social integration. Pope Francis said that human trafficking is an open wound on the body of contemporary society. Indeed, human trafficking can be considered an indicator of human relationship in the age of globalization. It urged to break the silence and indifference, recognizing in the other my sister, my brother, member of the same human family loved by God. Trafficking in person affects people everywhere, but inequality in economic, social, familial, cultural, and religious status makes women and girls particularly at risk. This is a clear indicator that gender inequality is one of the major drivers of human trafficking supported by a global culture of exploitation and violence against women. Talita Kum chose to stay with women and girls because our life is important. Women are centerpieces. I think that we can use a more updated word. Maybe we could say today are hubs for transforming mentality of exploitation and trafficking into care that empowers all of us to foster safe and thriving communities. The cry of trafficked victims and survivors call government, religious leaders, and all people of goodwill to take action working together for a time of heal. Let me highlight a few of the most urgent action needed at the policy level. First and foremost, it is time to heal the wounds of victims and survivors, their families and communities. Along with other needed policies, states should support the issuance of work and residence permit for victims of trafficking so that social and economic integration and inclusion can be pursued. The healing process requires often many years. There is an urgent need for a long-term psychosocial and healthcare assistance to heal the deep wounds in their souls, minds, and bodies. It is time to heal inadequate migration policies, implementing legal pathway of migration, promoting the fair treatment of migrants workers in the labor market, regardless of their legal status, including by preventing and denouncing abusive and fraudulent recruitment practices with special attention to women and girls. It is time to heal the inequalities forcing people in situation of vulnerabilities exploited by traffickers, focusing in prevention activities, especially with population at risk and situation of vulnerabilities. The last call is for every person. It is time to heal ourselves. 
this is probably the most important call to anti-trafficking, the personal transformation. It is time to heal our memory, our listening, our vision and our daily choices. This is essential to stand in a very concrete way by those who are deep in darkness of social vulnerability and exploitation. To make the healing process possible, we call everybody to disrupt the narrative of violence and exploitation through concrete daily gestures of welcome, care, empowerment and inclusion. Let us do it together. Thank you, Sister Gabriella, and for the four very concrete uh, recommendations you made. And I think, as you said, the last one, uh, this is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to heal ourselves um, and change the culture from one where this is just tolerated and accepted, where we're turning a blind eye. So I think that is very, very important for us all. Uh, I would now like to hand over to uh, Nella Scavo. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. And first of all, and uh, I am therefore immediately grateful for your indulgence with me and my strange Italian English. Uh, because of this, I need to, to read my speech. I listened with great interest uh, the uh, previous speeches. One of the intentions of this panel is to suggest answer proposal. However, I, I am only a journalist. So first and foremost, I need to give a name to the things we observe. And above all, I have the need and also the duty to try to find a connection between the facts. In recent years, for example, about migrants and refugees, and especially in the Mediterranean region, has been the stage for the largest, for the largest mass destruction operation known in recent decades. By tapping into uh, prejudice about the foreigner and manipulating information, it has been possible to allow the institution, institutionalization of mass deportation, torture, and physical elimination of tens of thousands of human beings not with uh, silence, not with uh, indifference, but with the complicity of politics and public opinion. In recent years, an undeclared world war has been fought in the Mediterranean. The main political, military and economic powers are trying to hegemonize the region. Turkey, Russia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the OTAN or NATO and ATO members, the ambiguity of the United States, the uncertainty of Italy, and the cynicism of France, for example. The list uh, will be long. On the Eastern and Middle Eastern front, Turkey has exploited this political asset to achieve political and economic consolidation in its own interests. Just think of the opening and closing of borders according to communists. In March of last year, for example, I was on the border between Turkey and Greece, and we witnessed this attempt by Turkey to put, to put pressure on Greece and Europe by pushing hundreds of thousands of people along the land, the land borders. I remember, I remember the European Union Commission President von der Leyen when she arrived at the Greek, at the Greek border uh, in a town called uh, Castanias, she said this part of Greece is the shield of Europe. The International Red Cross was very angry because this shield was opposed to families with children. The solution was found by refinancing the program of hospitality, or rather the detention of migrants and refugees in Turkey. The same thing is happening in Libya. Some people have made a flag out of, of it in order to manage an electoral consensus, consensus in Europe, but uh, it's uh, a story that began years ago, long before the more or less secret agreements with Libya and Europe cannot simply turn its back. Unfortunately, 
as you know, a significant number of people do not arrive in Europe and do not return to Libya, but they die in the, the liquid Mediterranean cemetery. But once again, Europe is uh, reacting with fear, expressing concern, because entire political careers have been built on the meat of the closed ports, on the rejection of the possibility of uh, any form of application of human rights in Libya, which we know negotiation, for example, are underway to ensure that Tripoli will sign even progressively to the International Convention of Human Rights while instead agreements have been concluded for the arrivals, arrivals of weapons, ammunition, equipment to be able to control the border with military forces. In addition to all this, we have finally discovered and documented, showing also official documents, that the Italian mafias, and especially the Sicilian and Calabrian mafias, you know, called the Cosa Nostra in Sicily and Drangheta in Calabria, have strengthened their position in the Mediterranean and in Europe by establishing agreements with the Libyan militia. Militias that uh, develop, in particular, the, smug the smuggling of people and oil. And here we come to the connection with uh, Latin America, because to the traditional traffic has been uh, added uh, the great distribution of illic illicit uh, substances, both those produced in North Africa and those sent directly by the South American Narcos Network. Recently, there have been numerous uh, seizures of cocaine. We are talking about several tons, which were supposed to reach Libya, to reach Libya, and thanks to the same groups financed by Italy and Europe for the containment of migration flows, were destined to a series of exchanges between ships that uh, take place near the uh, island of Malta to drug illegal markets in all Europe and the Balkans. This system of power and business sees human beings as source of funding, as shown by the torture for extortion in Libya. All the states involved uh, know this truth, but they prefer silence. A year ago, three torturers, two, three torturers uh, worker, uh, uh, working in a Libyan government prison camp in Zawiya, in the north of Libya, were convicted by a court in Sicily. Their defense lawyer, trying to exonerate them, argued the following. The torture and abuse were not a specific choice of these three men. They were not a torturers or night raptists, but they are part of the management of the migration phenomenon by the Libyan government policy, and since they are political choices of a foreign country, however, however uh, execrable these choices are, they are not prosecutable by the Italian jurisdiction. We are therefore talking about a judicial uh, ruling that uh, states that uh, violation and abuses are taking place in Libyan government, pri uh, government prison camp within the framework of a system that has institutionalized the torture. What we, according to the international law, call extortion, is instead described by many Libyan government sources as a bail for relays, borrowing from the common law system. The other criminal advantage for the, of the management of the uh, migratory flow is uh, precisely the possibility of uh, blackmailing Europe, in particular, country like Italy. For example, if you, they say, if you, the foreign government, do not grant me what I am asking you, we can put a certain number of migrants into the sea, and all doubt some of them will die, many will arrive in European shores, in European shores. So the management of the migratory flow is a very powerful weapon of blackmail, so much that the pandemic was used as a pretext to declare for the first time in history the official closure of the ports of Italy and Malta for reason of public health. Afghanistan, Afghanistan is a case in point. 
for almost two decades, millions of refugees uh, camped, camped outside Afghanistan have been hoping to return to a finally pacific, pacified country as they had been promised, but today they have no prospect. Either they return to submit uh, to the Taliban or leave their camps and try their luck in Europe. Therefore, when uh, a European countries such as Italy, Slovenia and Croatia turn away Afghan refugees who are often chased away with violence and abuse, they are not only trying to remove these people, but also divide their and, I think, our responsibilities. But uh, it's not only the sound, uh, the sound of war that determines the roads of refugees. Last year, so to, uh, last year so was the year in uh, which climate change uh, proved to be a powerful new driver. Uh, last year's disaster caused 30.7 uh, million new internal displacements worldwide, the highest number in the last 10 years, triple than 9.8 million new people displaced by conflict and violence. In conclusion, our job as journalists is not to hide from this, but to tell the story. Of course, sometimes it's very, very hard and complex. For sure, some, uh, some, uh, some of us are at risk and we and our beloved families are, have changed over part of our life, our own life. But even with our help, with your help, uh, we have to try. Thank you all for uh, the patience with uh, me and my strange Italian English. Thank you, Nello, for your very good English, actually. Yeah. So uh, thank you for that. But um, I think at the end there, you pointed out three areas, migration, conflict, and climate change, which really raise the risks to people who are displaced and then become a potential commodity for those who will traffic individuals. But I think one of the uh, recollections I have that hits home about migration was the death of Alan Kurdi who, when he was washed up on the shores of Turkey when he was only aged four, the world stopped. And there were comments from President Erdogan who talked of this being our brother or our sister. David Cameron, the UK Prime Minister, who was outraged and said there needs to be a global response. Justin Trudeau, who at the time was running for the prime ministerial elections in Canada, halted his campaign. Enda Kenny, the Irish Prime Minister Taoiseach, speaking out against it, and New Zealand and Australia holding memorials for Alan Kurdi. That was the sentiment then. Where are we now, some six years on? Where are we in the compassion that was being spoken about by world leaders and the move and the need for change around migration? when we are now not doing rescues in the Mediterranean and we are now, in a way, just blocking borders and doing, as you quite rightly said, pushbacks on migration. And the Council of Europe itself has commented on that on its reports around trafficking, how the pushback culture has increased risk to some of the most vulnerable in our society. So I now want to turn the floor back to the uh, panelists and also we'll be coming to the audience for questions. So if you have some, please get them ready. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to, talk, to uh, ask uh, um, Daniele, you said that you had some concrete suggestions that you were going to make. Could you share those with us now, and having heard the uh, contributions of others?
the global percentage of believers will grow from the current 84% to 87%. Religion is by nature rooted in communities and is an integral part of the person's identity. In this perspective, the Order of Malta drafted a compact called Religions in Action with the contribution of Christian and Muslim experts. The document was presented yesterday by the Grand Chancellor of the Order of Malta at the IF20 in Bologna. The aim of the compact is to support religious communities and faith-based organizations that dedicate their social and spiritual resources to help mitigate the effect of the conflict and enhance the joint delivery of humanitarian support to victims. I would like to underline the joint delivery. The document appeals to the moral values that are universally shared by those with faith and other persons of goodwill and which are committed to the protection of human life and dignity. Why not thinking of drafting a similar document which, based on principles and values shared by all religions and faith, would appeal to joint action by religious leaders and communities and faith-based organizations to combat the scourge of human trafficking and modern slavery and to assist the victim together. It would be a great, valuable, concrete example of interreligious dialogue and a common commitment in favor of the so many vulnerable victims, be they minors, girls, women, people in need, of a shameful and unacceptable phenomenon that violates human dignity and should prompt the reaction of all men of goodwill. Pope Francis, highlighting the significance of the whole day against the trafficking of human beings, said that this um, day helps us to remember this tragedy and encourages us not to stop praying and fighting together as reflection and awareness should always be accompanied by concrete gestures that open path to social emancipation. Let me quote also Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Science and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Even if religious leaders do not pray at the same altar, they can and should act together to defend human dignity. Other suggestions may include a strong commitment by governments, religious and faith-based institutions, NGOs, civil society, to raise people's awareness of human trafficking and the sexual exploitation in prostitution and pornography. Or to continue working for cooperate responsibility in ensuring supply chains are free from slave labor. Working against child labor. Offering pre-departure orientation programs for foreign workers about their rights and the possible dangers, especially in the maritime, domestic service, and agricultural sectors. Opening the eyes of consumers to the risk of supporting slave labor when purchasing very cheap product. Advocating a greater opening of legal channels of migration and fostering development projects in countries of departure, so migration is a choice, not a necessity. Just to remind that I, I lost.
I spoke about uh, legally, legal channels of migration, also considering that whether they are escaping war or, and violence or pursuing better education and livelihood opportunities, too few children find pathways to move regularly and safety with their families. This increases the likelihood that the children and their family members will turn to irregular and more dangerous routes or that children will move on their own, leaving them more vulnerable to violence, abuse and exploitation by traffickers. Other suggestion to advocate for an end of a forced marriage, forced begging, forced reproduction and organ trafficking, including by encouraging more people to become voluntary organ donors, to set up interstate and the trafficking committee to share information, promote education, monitor trafficking in their country, and coordinate assistance to victims. In short, the, ambition, the ambitious project must be to establish a real effective partnership at the national and international level. Thank you. Thank you for those concrete uh, recommendations. And I think um, the only part of human trafficking that has been incorporated in the G20 recommendations and the leaders' recommendations and documents is in re relation to supply chains and government procurement. And there was a commitment that was made in Argentina, which was then uh, re remade in uh, Tokyo and last year in uh, Saudi Arabia. But it was looking at one part, which was about supply chains. And we've talked about the lack of progress. And when we think that the government money, the government's money that they spend on our behalf are our taxes, our contribution, and yet they can be used in procurement to pay for what is human trafficking. If we look at, during the pandemic, the demand for personal protection equipment it was identified that some of the people who were manufacturing that were in forced labor or exploitation. And then we look at the fishing industry that we know, for example, that there is great demand from produce around the world. So why is it that we haven't got a business culture of accountability? But we have when we talk about the quality of cars or the sanction that comes if you breach emissions. As we know, it was multi-billions that one European manufacturer was fined for falsifying emissions in the United States. Or only recently, an international company faced a 225 million fine in Ireland for data protection breaches. Yet, if your company has people exploited in the supply chain, it's seen as an inevitability. So why have we not brought that accountability? Many of us came here by aircraft and the controls and the measures and the technology about every part of that journey, whether it's to the airport, in the taxi, the size of the tires, the speed, the qualifications of the driver, are all covered by rules and regulations. Then when we get to the airport, the security, the aircraft, the way it's controlled, the way it flies, where it flies, how it flies, the person flying it, the staff who look after us in the cabin, all strict controls. And that's whether you're here in Italy or in most places in the world. Yet we always say supply chains are too difficult. Yet we see the online supply chain is very often related to children now being exploited live time where the demand is growing for sexual gratification or where women are ordered online or sold online or advertised online for sexual exploitation. And yet we say the internet highway cannot be policed and managed in the same way as the highways of our real world. What is it that is holding us back? Where is the vested interest that is stopping this? Is it financial gain? Is it the power of commerce? Is it just 
our indifference? Is it just that we don't really care about the most vulnerable? When we see the thousands of religious sisters around the world, and I have met them firsthand, the work they do, that should open our hearts. When I've been in Greece and I've met Syrians who were, came to Europe, a man and a woman I met with their young baby, she was a doctor, he was a civil engineer. When they arrived in Europe, they received nothing. He was having to work and was exploited and ended up in forced labor, a civil engineer. Or the 15-year-old girl I met in Trapani who came into Italy having had to leave Eritrea because she was going to be conscripted into the army and would safe face a life of exploitation. Her parents didn't want her to be raped day in, day out. She left Eritrea and came to Europe. When she arrived in Europe, her future was going to be exactly the same as that that she fled from. Or the mothers that I met in Nigeria who told me about their sons being killed, murdered. They paid everything to get them into Europe, but when they got to Libya, the funds ran out, they became worthless. The commodity value of that life was now to be extinguished because their value has gone. This is what we are facing, yet our responses very rarely meet that demand. And the only way we can actually change that is by coming together, by changing ourselves, as Sister Gabriella said. So I think it is so important that people of goodwill and people of faith start to think about the solutions, how we can call upon our world leaders, how we can call upon our leaders locally to open their hearts. Many of you will have heard of the Santa Marta Group, which is something that I was involved in from the start. The Santa Marta Group, which was launched by Pope Francis in 2014 at the Vatican, started from a meeting in a church hall north of London with a small group, which then expanded to the Bishop's Conference in England and now has reached globally, working with Bishop's Conference, religious sisters and political leaders to try and open those hearts and is doing training, whether that's in Southeast Asia, whether that's in Latin America, in Europe, but trying to bring that change and works very close with many religious sisters like Sister Gabriella. So you've heard the presentations, you've heard about the role of media, the role of business, the role of faith. So now it's time for perhaps some questions from yourself. Um, if you could think of what you see people who are in positions of authority, what is it that we should be asking the G20 in particular, but faith communities around the world? What and where is there an opportunity to change? So I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, sorry, the lady at the back in red. Um, if you could, if you're happy to say where you're from, um, and if your question is for a particular person, is you could say that as well. Uh, my name is Azza Karam, and um, I serve Religions for Peace. I am Egyptian, but living in the United States. I just wanted to thank every single person on the panel very much for brilliant presentations, and especially the sister, because I was attuned to you speaking of Talita Kum, which um, I have to take my hats off to if I had one. Um, have, I've heard a great deal about your work and I think it's brilliant. I wanted to ask two questions, if I may, and I would ask them to the panel, but the first one is really more for the sister. To what extent do you feel that the multi-religious collaboration is not only helpful, I think we can assume it would be helpful, but how, how would it help to try to amplify the multi-religious collaboration? I note, um, uh, Your Excellency's exposition about the um, document that I think is brilliant that was issued by your, uh, the Order of Malta. Um, I, and I know that it's based on a number of different uh, joint initiatives, but I'm just curious, how do we take it to the, not just two religions working together, but to the multi-religious and to the global level? And if you see any, any value added to that advocacy, but also how would you want to do that? I, I head a multi-religious organization that's global in nature. I would like this to be a, a very important part of the work that we do. 
Um, on the other question, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and I just wanted to ask you if you had any knowledge on what we're hearing from some of our interreligious councils about the, the fact that it's, it's the trafficking of organs is also part of the hu human trafficking um, horror, if you will. And if you, if you had any information or knowledge about that or could, could speak a little bit to some of this, because I think the issue obviously is, is the human trafficking itself, but these people are also having their organs taken out and then some of them di dying. So I just don't know if there's any info on that and, and would like to know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aza, for the question. We are a grassroots network, so we believe deeply that the change is starting from the local communities, and uh, we do not have a receipt because every reality is different. Our methodology is to bring people together, to dialogue together, to study what is going on there in that country, which are the powerful experience that they have, the governmental, the existing law, NGOs, uh, religious uh, uh, actors that are, are active in that reality. So the more we are thinking together, the more we are able to promote a change coming from inside. Tlitakum, it was not a paternalistic or maternalistic attitude of God, but it was to move the internal, inner, power of life. So we do not have to teach to anybody. We need to bring together because each one of us has the power of change. And for this reason, the real change is coming from uh, every person interest and the interreligious dimension, the multi-religion, we have to find that each one of us has to find uh, their role. And uh, I have to say that women has a special role to, to play. And often we are really a side of the decision-making process. And I think this is a big mistake that we are doing. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. And uh, um, yes, we know about uh, organ trafficking, especially in uh, Asia, uh, for example, India. And uh, we have some uh, suspect about Libya. Just this morning, my newspaper published a story about uh, investigation in uh, organ trafficking in Libya. But uh, my colleagues um, find some years ago uh, evidence of this in Sinai Peninsula, especially uh, about uh, um, migrants for, uh, from uh, uh, refugees from the uh, Tigray region. It's very, very difficult to, to discover this, but we know in uh, some hospital in Italy arrived uh, sometime people with uh, health problem and uh, the, um, the, the, in the hospital they discovered, for example, uh, that uh, before, the, um, uh, before the, the trip from uh, his country to Italy, they sell his kidney. Uh, is uh, is difficult uh, to 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 discover evidence, but uh, uh, this is a, a horri horrible uh, business along uh, uh, migrants' roads. Thank you, and it's uh, also, it's been reported quite widely in Mozambique, uh, and faith groups have been dealing with the issue of organ trafficking and, and other parts of Africa, so it is a, a major problem, and it's something the Pontifical Academy was tasked by Pope Francis to look at specifically, and they have done research and documents on it with, uh, uh, with a professor uh, from um, the US who is part of the World Health Organization. So I think that um, there is a lot said about it, but uh, in terms of action, perhaps that's what's missing. But that first question, Your Excellency, what extent multi-religious collaboration could extend, I think that's one I would like to ask you as well, the question that came forward. Yes. The interreligious collaboration is, uh, if you want, uh, a 
an ambition and uh, a, a task just to prove that in practice the, this inter-religious dialogue um, is, um, is um, in function. And I think that this is, would be the, the best way uh, to prove and also to, 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 to increase our, uh, all the efforts to, that uh, are accomplished and to prove in practice that uh, without any any difference or, or, or between this or that or, or, um, religions and uh, to which religion a, a victim belongs, but there is a common effort to, to, to combat and uh, to contribute to defeat this, uh, this, uh, this um, phenomenon. Uh, I would just, uh, if, uh, if I allow, I would just uh, ask our friend Gabriella Butani whether he has uh, personal witnesses of uh, interreligious cooperation in uh, her valuable uh, daily work in favor of uh, victim uh, of trafficking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, we, first of all, in the care of survivors, we are caring for people of different faith tradition or people that also they do not recognize themselves. Uh, the spiritual support is given uh, sometimes directly, sometimes providing also spiritual director or people of their own faith, respecting uh, uh, their faith. So this is for us very important not to misuse uh, the position of help giver for forced conversion or manipulation. And this is important because we are working for freedom and freedom is really important to be kept also at this level. At least this is what we are bringing in our training and how we support people to do. And second, uh, whenever we can, we encourage one each other to promote dialogue at local level. And we have a really a beautiful experience with Buddhist um, nuns and Catholic sisters in, uh, in Thailand, where they were gathering together. They started bringing different knowledges and teaching one another according to their expertise, because we have a faith tradition, but we have also personal skills to be uh, implemented. And a beautiful experience in the Middle East where uh, people are really working together. I, I received some photos of uh, a group of Druze, uh, Catholic, Shias and Sunni women going together to raise awareness um, uh, about human trafficking. Working together as one community and visiting the different communities uh, throughout uh, Lebanon, for example, or in Jordan. I think that uh, these are very simple examples, but also in Indonesia for the International Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Human Trafficking that Pope Francis entrusted to Talita Kum and Religious Sister every February the 8th, uh, many other religions are uh, gathering with us because prayer is really a very powerful tool to stay together because uh, uh, is really giving us uh, the strength to face everyday situation, painful and violent situation like trafficking. Do we have any more questions? Um, the gentleman here. Okay, and <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, I'm Alessandro Balbo from the Quotidiano Nazionale here in Bologna. And uh, first of all, I wanted to, to say to the sister that I have known personally and, see, and have seen uh, the Talita Kum uh, work uh, at, at the Northwestern uh, 
migration route in uh, Oux and at the Mont Genevre. So thank you. And um, I wanted to ask everyone about the future role of uh, the EU in the Afghanistan neighboring countries, because as we have, as we've heard from Nello Scavo, the EU in its previous intervention in both the Mediterranean route and in the Balkanic route has in the facts financed violation of human rights and human trafficking. Do you think that the future action, actions of the EU will be able to prevent slavery and human trafficking or it will be simply another Turkey, another Libya? Thank you. I think if we go to you, Nello first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for this question. And uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I, I don't know if my, my answer could, could satisfy your, uh, your question, but uh, um, I have no optimism uh, for uh, uh, European Union politics about uh, migrant uh, uh, issues because uh, uh, because I think we need uh, uh, politicians and community need a uh, wide and good and proof awareness. And uh, this is a problem. For example, um, for example, I think uh, Pope Francis uh, often forces us to reflect on the Third World War in pieces fought in pieces. Uh, I have an example. I have an example because uh, uh, you know that one of the qualities of a good journalist is to prevent the question, and I have the answer to your question written before. <laughs> no, no. Uh, take the case of the Yemen, one of the forgotten war. For a number of years, uh, tens of thousands of migrants from the Horn of Africa reached the Arabian Peninsula by paying off Somali pirates, landing in Yemen itself, and then dispersing to the various monarchies and emirates, often to work, and more of this was forced as slaves. In recent years, this flow has stopped, quite stopped, while the number of Africans fleeing the Arabian Peninsula and uh, again throughout Somali pirates, returning to the Horn of Africa is growing. Those who have some money in their pockets often decide to invest, uh, uh, to invest it in crossing to Europe. The cause, the cause of this route reversal is the war in Yemen, of course, but to fail to mention as all Italian and uh, other European governments have done for many years, uh, that our country, for example, Italy, has been the main exporter of uh, aerial bombs used by the Saudi coalition fighting in Yemen. And to fail to say that this, uh, this has uh, uh, also increased the disorder in the Horn of Africa, and that directly or indirectly, this production and export authorized by the governments have the additional effects of increasing the flow of migrants to Italy and Europe. And uh, uh, I don't urge politi uh, politics to, to, to show this, uh, this choice. But this choice has uh, a consequence for uh, uh, migrants. It's uh, strange because we speak about uh, migrants from Africa, they don't understand sometimes that the consequence of Yemen war, Yemen is not Africa. And uh, for this reason, I repeat that it's necessary for us, uh, journalists and for readers and for community, to understand the complexity of this phenomenon and at the same time to uh, study and show the connection between different facts and between uh, different countries. Thank you. Well, it's not easy to answer your question because uh, I think that uh, uh, foresees what will happen in Afghanistan and uh, in, uh, is the, 
is, uh, is very complex. The EU has elaborated a strategy on uh, combating trafficking in human beings from period 221-225, based on the need for urgent action to stop the human rights violation and, and impunity for perpetrators. So there is goodwill. Now the problem is how to translate goodwill in, into practice. Uh, we are confident, we hope, and also as uh, European people, that uh, the EU action will be always uh, inspired and moved by those who are some rooted principles of EU, EU such as uh, generosity, spirit of openness, and uh, also and to act in favor of uh, for uh, the the development and also the the the, the well-being of all people living on or, or arriving in 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 the EU so this is what as I suppose we can, we can say at this, uh, obviously it's a, a common wish and also a common concern, but uh, and, uh, we will that uh, uh, Europe uh, and the European Union in particular will uh, create, uh, will always create, uh, you know, uh, a breach of uh, a, a cooperation and, and not um, build up uh, walls. And I think that uh, we hope that it is not only a slogan or, uh, or, um, or just uh, uh, rhetoric, but uh, it will be translated into practice. Thank you. I will try also. There is a beautiful expression in English, I wish I would, <laughs> that I have learned in the classes. And this is a case of I wish I would, uh, um, because uh, the reality is very um, complex. What I would like, I would like to take this opportunity to stress something very important for me. I got involved in anti-traffic in Brazil when I was in, uh, in the Northeast and later in Amazonia. And uh, the way of uh, thinking and approaching the issues of human trafficking from that context is completely different from the one we are uh, used to listen in EU or occidental uh, approach. And this is use, usually the leading uh, the, uh, discussion and the leading point of view on all what we are saying about uh, many topics. And I wish I would that also the first attitude will be to listen deeply. What is going on, not only the effects on Europe, but what is going on in that region. What is affecting uh, uh, the, the balances or the political and the social realities in Afghanistan and around Afghanistan. This is my wish, that we are able to listen deeply to other region and not always to put our culture and reality as um, the leading perspective of reflection. Thank you. And I think... It is a um, lady. It is a lady. Sorry, no, I was just going to answer the question ah, about sorry, the... Sorry. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I think from the EU perspective, um, we've really gone into a position across the EU of perhaps knee-jerk politics. And maybe that started with a risk to the actual group itself with the UK proposing and then electing to leave. But I think what we've done is, if we look in the EU, as has been said, there is a protocol, a directive at the EU of what should be done. There is a Council of Europe convention which spells out things like there should be no reformment, there should be a non-punishment prison principle, there should be legal aid, there should be victim support, there should be a national referral mechanism. All of those have been signed up 
to countries, by countries, in the Council of Europe, the 47 countries. But we don't see much delivery. We see partial deliveries. We see bits here, bits there. But we don't see a collaboration. One of the important things about that convention is it involves civil society and how civil society play an important role. And we seem to have forgotten the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that were launched by Pope Francis in 2015. And what the worry is, it was even before the pandemic, as Antonio Guterres said at the General Assembly last year, that we saw that support and the respect for the vulnerable was deteriorating and that global aid budgets were deteriorating or reducing. So I think this is a, a big issue. And is the EU in a position to change this? Well, we have to work on hope. We have to be able to convince world leaders. And that is what faith communities can do through their collectiveness. That was what the EU was supposed to be, about a collective of goodwill, good process, understanding and recognizing different cultures, but bringing a change that had people and equality at the heart of it. That was the purpose of the UN. It was supposed to be about not getting us to heaven, but about stopping us living in hell. That was what was said about the UN. But actually, we now have very often hell on earth for far too many people. So I do think there is hope at the EU, but I think it will take the people, the electorate. These are democracies, and it needs the people who elect to bring the change. That is the whole basis of democracy. And people of faith, as we heard, will represent 87% of the world, currently representing over 80% of the world. Where is our voice collectively for change? I think we had one more question. There was a lady at the back. Did you have a question? Thank you. I want to thank you first and foremost all for your interventions. Um, I'm Christina with Islamic Relief and I was a participant or moderator of the refugee panel yesterday where we slightly alluded to these issues, so I'm glad there was a panel that went into them in much more depth. Um, I actually had a question. Uh, we've been talking about an increase in deterioration, increase in vulnerabilities, and I, I have more of an ethical question around lesser evil that I would like to pose to the panel um, because my own thinking has started to change and as an organization, um, we obviously do a lot of work with refugees all around the world um, and we do a lot of advocacy work and we've always very much worked within our, our faith tradition to advocate uh, for the elimination of you know, harmful practices like early child marriage, forced marriage, and I know that came up today. But at the same time that I also now visit a lot of um, NGO camps and, and foreign urban settings where these very vulnerable women and children are finding themselves. Um, I'm sometimes finding my own uh, thinking on some of the early marriage changing because it is more of a protective measure in many cases, um, whereas these girls could be trafficked and, and other you know, sexual exploitation and others. So I'm just wondering when we start to think about some of these very complex issues, <laughs> um, where we kind of fall, fall on what is the lesser evil. Evil is evil. I am not able to set uh, a, a hierarchy, a hierarchical perspective. Um, like love is love and respect is respect. I think uh, that we need to, to find uh, a different narrative. Uh, for this reason, prevention is very important. Um, we need to support survivors. We need uh, to give them support. We need also people to understand because uh, one of the main challenges we are facing is the, what I call the internalization of exploitation. It is normal. Evil is normal. This is not normal. This is not the normality of God. Evil exists, does exist. 
but the end word of God for every person is dignity, is love. I do not know if I was able to answer, but it's a huge challenge because we need really to, to give a new meaning to the dignity of every person and to find it. And we can do only it together in dialogue, in deep listening. In, often when I was, uh, uh, at the time I was active on, uh, with survivors in Brazil, I was used to say, if I were able to watch this person and they feel in my eye that they are a person, something may change. Because often we lose the flavor of dignity. We do not believe anymore that we, have, we are a person with that value. And we need to restore it starting from our way of watching our way of listening, not judging. And this is a huge, huge work of transform, that transformed myself as a first step. And uh, we need really to support every person because evil is real. And uh, we need to disrupt the violence of evil with new narratives, with the new uh, way of educating people. And we, this will bring us in, uh, in a marginalized sectors of our religion, of our societies, of our communities. We need to take the courage to stay with the marginalized people and also taking the consequences staying with them at the margins. Thank you. Um, just one comment I'd like to make about when you start to rationalize evil is you can transform that into, say, for the greater good. And very often the greater good doesn't include the marginalized. It includes the privileged, or if we go to some nations, it includes where there is no democracy and where individuals do not have rights. So once we start to rate something in that way, then that actually gives those who operate with evil attitudes and activities, in effect, impunity to operate at a certain level. And once evil starts, we know it doesn't know where to stop. So I think we need to, as Sister Gabriella says, deal with evil as something that we don't accept we know it goes on like many things in the world that we don't agree with, but that doesn't mean to say that we have to accept them. And we don't rationalize and create areas of vulnerability and impunity for those who profit on the exploitation, in this case, of levels of human trafficking. I'm afraid we're coming to the end of our 90 minutes, um, and I would like to hand over to my co-chair um, who's going to, I think, wrap up now. Just uh, a few words. Thanking you, first of all, all the presence. Well, the theme of uh, this year, IF20, is a time to hear. And the discussion proved that uh, it's also a time to act in a more efficiently and a coordinated way. Big, if big is the challenge, bigger must be our commitment. And just to remind that the need for improved international response to human trafficking and commitment to its eradication is illustrated by its prominent inclusion in the targets of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Thank you. So thank you everybody and uh, this session is now complete and uh, may you have a great day here in the lovely weather in Bologna. Thank you.